Hello, I'm Ken Burrell from Pragmatic PMO. If you're a project manager and you've ever thought at the end of a project, if I'd known then what I know now, I'd have done things differently, then you'll appreciate that everything seems clearer and easier with hindsight. Generating your own hindsight is hard and often painful. George Bernard Shaw said, if history repeats itself and the unexpected always happens, how incapable man must be of learning from experience. I think that project managers can learn a lot from each other's experience, especially from sharing their scars. Sharing experiences gives you access to someone else's hindsight without the hard work and the pain. So as part of my campaign for real project managers, on your behalf, I'm talking to some real project managers I've had the pleasure of working alongside so that you can benefit from their experience. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Evelyn Weber, who's going to share some of her experiences with us. Evelyn, I'd like you to start, please, by just giving us an introduction to your background and how you got into project management. Probably been doing this for about 25 years now, quite scarily. Um, I began my career in HR, personnel department in those days. Right. Um, but um, in a medium-sized chartered accountancy practice, um, but found the sort of recruitment side quite repetitive and quite boring, so moved into a more operational role, assisting the partners um, with projects and operations um, and one of the first projects was a move from their three sites into one new building at Old Bailey um, so that was my first project um, and since then I've probably managed over 40,000 people's moves Wow, um, that's a lot of people a lot of people over the years I've been very very fortunate in working with a whole host of fantastic clients um, and they've ranged from banks, um, insurance companies, to charities, retail organisations. So it's mostly move projects that you do, office, office it's moves? move centred. Right. And then I do a field of work around that. Um, so typically, <coughs> how many people would you be moving on one of these projects? I think the smallest move I've done is two. Right. And the biggest is... 6,000. So okay, so quite a range there. It does range, yeah. They tend to be in the early thousands. Sometimes the smallest ones can be uh, as problematic as the biggest ones. So can you tell us about uh, a scar, so something that happened on a project that you were managing that went particularly wrong and what you learned from it? Mm -hmm. um, it was Alan and Overy's move to, from St Paul's to Spitalfields. Um, at the time it was the largest relocation in the city. Um, and I managed the relocation, all the planning of it, the whole master programme and everything else. So it was a, quite a big task. Um, due to a number of delays in the handover of the building, our programme of moving their staff, there was about two and a half thousand people, it was supposed to be over a four month period, but it got whittled away down to about six weeks. Um, so it also meant that they were on severe penalties for the decommissioning of their building. Right. Uh, so they had to get out on time. So it also meant that that had to happen at the same time as the moves. Uh, so it was a very, very mm -hmm. tight program. There were a number of issues which added to the complexity of that. So firstly, they were moving all of their existing IT kits. So there was over 6,000 pieces of IT kits. So that was monitors, servers, test labs. Everything had to be moved and reset up. Um, even though they had a massive archiving exercise, as a law firm, they still had over 23 kilometres of filing to move. So 23 kilometres of shelf space? Of shelf space. Wow. To move in that six week period as well. Okay. So the logistics of that had to all That's be a worked lot, out. A lot of crates. <laughs> a lot of crates. Um, and thirdly, because of the clearance had to be done in a fully ecological manner for ANOs to meet with their corporate responsibility, okay. but also they were very adverse to any publicity that they might get because uh, there was a very long and protracted approach to ensuring that everything was disposed of in an ecological way. Yeah. Um, and there were a number of different avenues that we had to go down to, to make sure that that happened, okay. uh, which added to the complexity. It turned out to be seven days, a six nights operation for a seven week period. So on a Monday to Thursday, they pack 500 linometres of filing every day. So we had to sequence that and make sure it could be released by the people that were moving. Then at night that that was transferred over to the new building and unpacked. Um, then on Friday night, we'd move the IT over. That all had to be reconnected so that could be started to be tested on Saturday. Sunday, we'd move personal crates and carriers. Saturday with the filing. 
Sunday night we would snag, Monday post move, and then Monday night we would start clearing the areas that had been vacated during the week, plus start the filing and the whole process over again. So it was a massive logistical. Sounds like it. So, so what's the mm. scar then? What's the bit? What's the bit that what's went the scar? wrong? Okay. Bit, bit that went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, on the first move, the very first Friday night. So everything had gone well during the week. We packed up our file, and it had all gone. Uh, the first move on the Friday night, we'd packed up the first lorry of IT. It was on its way. We were on the road. There was a major incident, which was uh, turned out to be a fatality on the commercial road at Spitalfields which was also the access road into the loading bay for the Allen and Overy building. Right. So at six o'clock on the Friday night, the road was closed and our lorries were stuck behind that with oh. no means of access into the building. Right. So <laughs> once we realised what had happened, um, sent everyone on an early dinner break to <laughs> keep, try and keep time. them happy to give us some thinking time and to try and think what how could we get around this because obviously the front of the building was pedestrianized it was across cobblestones of bollards there was it was a Friday evening everyone was out drinking it was uh, yeah not not the ideal site so I got in contact with the emergency services um, and they informed me it would be several hours probably all all night that the road would be closed because there was a fat fatality so we knew where we stood so the last thing I really wanted to be doing was phoning the steering committee of Alan Novery on the very first night of the move saying that we were aborting it. So I was racking and racking my brains trying to think of something that we could do uh, to, to try and start the process anyway. Um, and after a while I remembered about all the contacts that I'd made at uh, the tenants associations meetings I used to attend. Uh, to brief them on what the plans were for the move in and I met councillors and uh, city corporation officials and the developers and I thought it's like seven half past seven on a Friday night trying to get them is probably going to be impossible but I thought I've got, I've got to try yeah. I've got to try they might be able to help me in some way I didn't know, yeah. quite know how um, but I started making phone calls and I was, what I was after was to see whether we could remove the bollards at the front of the building and come across the pedestrianised entrance okay. I thought it was pretty remote but I thought I will try anyway someone phoned someone someone else phoned someone else and a whole chain of phone calls and eventually we got permission miraculously wow so that was quite an achievement yes um, and while that was going on I realized at the side of the building um, there was actually a lean-to and then another set of pillars and the smaller of the vehicles to actually fit in between <laughs> the side of the building and this pillar with about four inches either side right. which meant we had access into a fire exit and a fireman's lift um, so at least it wasn't across all the cobblestones and it meant it was uh, a little bit quicker so right. although we finally got to unloading about four hours later than we should have done but we could actually start the move albeit at 10 o'clock on the Friday night instead of 6 o'clock so at least all the IT could get, kit, could get in during the night and then start to be recommissioned and tested so, over so the weekend. So using this approach were you able to get where you needed to be despite the roadblock is that what you're saying? We were running behind but at least we were on we managed right, to so catch up. Right the roadblock's still in place the, the police are still doing there. what they need to yeah. but you could get in and out because you'd taken out the bollards and you're going down this little alleyway mm -hmm. Right, okay. So you're behind schedule but still still going. But still going. Okay. So uh, yeah, we managed to complete the move by the Sunday night. Um, so we just drafted in some extra resources on the Saturday and Sunday to make up for the delay. Uh, but the move went ahead and we completed it. Wow, so a, a far more eventful move weekend than you were planning for by the sound of it. Precisely. But you prevailed. <laughs> so. Um, what did you learn from that situation? What would you recommend to other people um, that, that they should do, either to recover from a situation like that or to avoid getting into that sort of situation in the first place? I would say always do your contingency planning. You may not have come up with an idea or something like that that was going to go wrong, but at least it gets you in the mindset of thinking about alternatives and what the alternatives may be. So always do that, no matter how futile you think it is going to be at the beginning of a project. Contacts are invaluable. Spend your time making them and maintaining them because you never know when they're <laughs> gonna come and help you or you may be able to help them. 
um, and don't give up. So even if you don't think there is a solution, it may not be a perfect one, but there may be something that you can do um, in the end to make it work. Evelyn, thanks for your time, your openness and your insights. So today we've heard from Evelyn about how she recovered from something that went wrong on a project. Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. To me, that means that although the future may not be exactly like the past, it's often similar enough for the lessons of the past to be useful. So my challenge to you is what will you learn from this? What will you do differently in your projects as a result of Evelyn's experience? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, let me know by leaving a comment or a like or both or by sharing it with others on social media. If enough people think these videos are worthwhile, then I'll make more of them. If you want to appear in one, let me know. For other videos on project management topics, take a look at my video channel. For articles on project management and PMO topics, visit my website pragmaticpmo.com or follow me on Twitter at pragmaticpmo. To connect with me more personally, search LinkedIn for Ken Burrell Pragmatic PMO. In the meantime, until the next time, thanks for watching.